black and white black and white is a way of thinking if you think back to historically making print the printing press and text on white paper and then graphic process of engraving gravure liner cutting which also are essentially black and white processes and then the start of photography which was a monochrome and then movies also started monochrome so there's a history of thinking in black and white that feels very close to what i do but what about colors some artists think in colors they would start an image thinking of a color for me it always starts with line or tone and so I'm very tone deaf. I can't keep a tune. I can hear if someone sings out of tune, and it's the same with colors. I can see if colors feel good or off, but it doesn't mean I can mix them and get them right. And so for me, black and white has been a way of thinking and not does the picture look nice. Mime. 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 Oh, mime, not mime. Mime. I went to theatre school in Paris. They call Jacques Lecoq, which is a school of movement rather than classical mime. It's not Marcel Marceau how to catch a balloon or push against the wall but it was about what is the impulse of a gesture which carries it through and so that's where thinking about either a gesture as an actor or the mark you make on a sheet of paper it's about understanding one thinks in the body rather than in theatrical terms the anglo-saxon way of making theater is always to start from the head to start with an analysis of the text with an, an analysis of psychology and when I think of mime or that kind of thing, it's about thinking with the body from the neck down. What is the expression given in our bodies, which is not necessarily the same as what our words, the words we say. But when, when was it at Jacques Lecoq studio? I was studio? at Jacques Lecoq in 1981 and 82, so 37 years ago. So it had a read influence on your work? No, it was fundamental, the work we did there. If I teach drawing, I still use exercises from Lecoq. A lot of the people I work with in the theatre have a similar background. Um, it gave me much more to learn about being an artist than any art school I did. Wow! Nostalgia! So nostalgia, the word nostalgia comes from the Greek word nostos. And nostos is a voyage of return, like the Odyssey is a voyage of Ulysses' return. And I think there are two kinds of nostalgia. You can have a recuperative nostalgia where you try to recreate the house that you had as a child. Or people wanting Brexit are having a kind of a nostalgia of trying to remake Britain the way they imagine it from their children's stories. Or you can have a kind of reflective nostalgia which takes account of the historical trajectory you are on and which knows it has to go back to the past to understand the present or the future. <coughs> so I hope that my interest in nostalgia is the latter and not the former. <laughs> Apartheid. Apartheid under which I lived for the first 40 years of my life I think showed me the importance of the absurd as a way of understanding society. Where you have a logic that's gone wrong, which it has a fundamental fault in it, in this characterizing people by the color of their skin, by those kind of narrow origins. And then you carry that through with great care, this absurdity, this false logic, and then you understand the absurd as the only way to describe it. It doesn't mean the funny or the joke or the lighthearted but it means something that is definitely beyond the ordinary scope of Cartesian rationality. And I mean, at the, now 25 years after the end of apartheid, we're still living with huge numbers of the problems that apartheid bequeathed us in South Africa, and some new ones and other ones. So the country is both transformed and untransformed. But uh, absurd is, is really in your work, right? I think the absurd, I've always been drawn to the absurd, and I think why am I drawn to the absurd, to Gogol, to Italo Svevo, to Ionesco, to Jari, to Ubu? It's because in that wildness, there's something that catches something of the spirit of the world that we're in, more than necessarily a detailed realist novel. And migration. Migration. So migration has become a big topic in Europe in the last 15 years, when suddenly Europe felt people are coming towards it. But migration has been a question in South Africa for decades. People being forced off their land, made to go to another part, shifting from one part of the country to another. But in a broader term, one has to understand the broader historical sweep of For the last 400 years, Europe sucking so much of the rest of the world dry, you know, all the wealth coming from gold mines, from sugar plantations, from cotton fields, all over the world, which has made, I mean, a city like this so wealthy 
such fantastic facilities, health facilities, educational facilities, infrastructure in the city that are you know, stronger and better and more enjoyable than other places. But then one doesn't understand the historical connection. And so when people say, well, we've had all these years of things taken from us, we want to find a more comfortable life, better health care, better education for our children than the places we are in, there's such a closing down of gates. Yes. And to understand the historical lack of generosity that is in there becomes morally obscene to see it from the outside. But generosity is nowhere. Generosity is not anywhere, but one has to understand if it cannot be described as generosity, let it be described as justice. Marching band. Marching bands in different places have different senses. In Britain, a marching band was like an industrial object. A, a colliery would have their marching band, or a trade union would have their marching band. In America, their marching bands go with sports teams. So you'd have the university's football, and they'd have their marching band. In South Africa, they're all connected to churches, to different churches. And if you start a new church, one of the first things you'll do is make a band. Buy the instruments, buy the uniform, and whoever owns the instruments and the uniforms, usually some new bishop, he owns the band. But there's an astonishing power of that sound in an enclosed space of the euphoniums, of the sousaphones, of the tubas, uh, of the drums going, that has an extraordinary comfort and power. It can also be demonic and terrifying. But there's something of that as kind of coming from a popular but specific culture but able to burst through walls. But you use it a lot, right? I use, I've used brass bands in several things. There's, in the studio, there's nothing better than the sound of a brass band in the enclosed studio. It's so powerful. Silent film. So the first silent films, there are two strands of silent films. The very first films was someone sticking the camera and recording the world as it went past, the Lumiere brothers. And that strain of filmmaking became documentary filmmaking. Film, the camera's ability to record the world as it passes. But there was another strand which came from people like Georges Méliès, who was a stage magician and used the technology of cinema as another one of the stage tricks. So it was always about invention, uh, phantasm, um, telling a story. And so that's obviously the side in which I feel close. And his first films were him performing in front of a painted backdrop in his studio with the camera switched on. So he was both the artist and the actor and the director and the cameraman. And there's an inventiveness in what he allowed himself, which people are still catching up with now in many kinds of filmmaking. Yes, because it's strange that in your work, people are not speaking. So words are written, they are not said, or they are, yeah. they are songs, yeah. but they don't speak. Then you get into a different world. That's, I mean, that's the kind of acting I never did, of long texts, of then you have to start working with actors in a different way and the films, I think of them mainly as a kind of drawing, sometimes it's just drawing, sometimes with actors, but uh, they're not psychological dramas. Pollution. There's a lot of the work that I've done over the years that have to do with the traces of utopian thinking. So there was a piece about Trotsky in exile in Istanbul in 1933 there's a piece about Shostakovich and uh, the Writers' Congress of 1934, the end of the utopian hopes of Soviet art making. There's a piece about the Chinese Cultural Revolution, uh, Notes Towards a Model Opera. Uh, again, things which fall apart, where there, there's an utopian moment of hoping to transform the world. And now in the 21st century, you understand the painful failures of so many of those uh, approaches. So one can neither be an optimist and say, oh, it's still coming, the revolution, nor can one become ahistorical and say it was not a factor in the world in the past. So one has to hold both of those things together. And you like I'm them. not a revolutionary, but I do know that without a kind of utopian thinking, there's just a gap. There's an emptiness in the world. Your next dream. My next dream is very hard until I'm in the middle of it. And then it starts to expand and flower. So I know there'll be an opera at some point. I know that there'll be more uh, sculptures. Each time I see an exhibition that excites me, like looking at the Picasso collages in the exhibition on Cubism here, the impulse is to be back in the studio and working around things that I've just seen. And that's when the next dream begins. 
Merci. Ok.